Um, yes. Cecinda Futhi Siselafa, Black Feminist Approaches to Cultural Studies in South Africa's 25 Years Since 1994, edited by Terelene Marco, Tiffany Willoughby Harard, and Abebe Zigeye, is a testimony to the survival and resilience of South African people. Some prominent themes generated by this work that have spoken to me are survival, resilience, remembrance, healing, power, and haunting. Contained in its pages are essays that grapple with these themes through a diversity of mediums of creative expression, including art, film, protest, academic research, and remembrance. The editors have categorized these essays into analyses of visual art and identity, healing, unsettling laughter, and critiques of white writing. The volume concludes with a postscript composed of reflections from undergraduate students at UC Irvine, serving as a metaphysical conversation with Winnie Mandela about her activism and her incarceration. The most potent orientation to Sasinda Futhi Siselafa may be the simple yet multivalent meanings of its title. Elaborated by Zethu Kakata in the first pages, Sasinda from Nguni can be translated as we survived. Siselafa means we are still here. As survivors of colonialism, racism, and sexism, the contributors channel this powerful idea. Black South Africans, particularly Black South African women and queer folk are still here fighting for more than just their lives, but for a new South Africa built by and for African people. The editor's compelling choice to use 1994 in the subtitle instead of post-apartheid, as many of the contributing authors directly and indirectly question the veracity of the proclamation of its death. In other words, is apartheid still here? Interconnectivity and polyphony or multiple voices? The unity of the volume is that in each piece it is that each piece speaks simultaneously to multiple truths and to the collective we. This we is reinforced on a structural level. The book is a polygraph. Sisilafa means we are still here. The essay by Khan explores the plural and singular I in her comparison of two black South African women visual artists. Marco graps with how white people see themselves in post-1994 South Africa, positioning themselves with an entangled, within an entangled narrative of suffering with Black South Africans. Sisilafa asserts that in plurality, there is power, power to resist, power to create, and power to remember. The themes of remembrance, haunting, and transgenerational dialogues evokes the power of ancestors. Kakata's essay on language addresses the centrality of education, cultural knowledge, and history. I quote, in African, or they quote, in African communities, the death of an elder is likened to the burning of a library. The death of an elder is likened to the burning of a library. Through preserving the memory, teachings, and knowledge of our elders, we not only engage with them in a transgenerational dialogue, summoning them into the present, but also arm ourselves with the tools we need to survive. Molebatsi's essay, Healing Perspectives of a Black Woman Poet, is a moving exploration of the relationship between herself, her daughter, and her mother. Molabatsi writes that time and certain conceptions of temporality insist that the dead and the unborn cannot exist together through the living. She works to keep her grandmother alive and therefore defying this narrative of separateness and transgenerational apartheid through remembrance and sharing her grandmother's lessons and her lessons with her child. In a poem to her daughter, she calls for her unborn child to clothe yourself in ancient selves, with ancient selves. This is a lesson that is repeated throughout the book. In the postscript, Willoughby Harard invites her students to clothe themselves in ancient selves through their reflections on Winnie Mandela. The power of this exercise of inclusion is made clear by the thought-provoking and emotional mosaic that is created by their pieces. 
Placed in conversation with the life, work, and death of Winnie Mandela, as well as previous essays, these essays, poems, and photographs are transgenerational, time-bending seance with the spirit of the larger-than-life Black woman activist that channel the themes of polyphony, haunting, and remembrance. In this exercise, the students clothe themselves in the life, work, and power of Winnie Mandela, summoning her to the world of the living, both as a haunting and as a resurrection. Their work adds to the palimpsest of Mandela's prison walls, transgressing the barriers of her cell and preventing her erasure. Sasinda Futhi Siselafa is a loud shout, an exclamation of being, of still hereness that is realized through the author's very presence and creative expressions. In these words and this text, there lies an overarching message of preserving, honoring, and following our Black African women's histories and creative expressions. A little background music, sorry about that, my alarm. Um, in these words and in this text, there lies an overarching message of creative, ex an overarching message of preserving, honoring, and following our Black African women's histories and creative expressions, allowing them to guide us to envision and forge a more just and joyous future for our children. This polygraph is a negation and a refusal of the power of the oppressors of the present and past to exert control over our bodies, our lives, and our futures. The title itself embodies resistance, resilience, and the ongoing survival of Black, Indigenous, South African women. It asks, are the born freers such as myself truly born free? As a South African person separated from my country, my culture, and my family, because of the violences of apartheid, the investigations and central themes of healing in Sisalafa cannot be understated. They have invigorated my own journey of healing and research on the apocalypses and the disconnections that have resulted from the perpetuating atrocities of apartheid, enslavement, and Jim Crow. While South Africa is still haunted by apartheid, through the exercises of polyphony and remembrance of our history, we too can create our own haunting. These are just some of the profound and imperative explorations made by the authors within. Thank you so much. It's really incredible listening to how you've interpreted this, Santiago, and and with, um, with your critical reading of the work, also your personal story, right? And that there is this link that you're making, that you're inviting us um, in a way to, to read with you. Um, and I think when you have been as immersed in, in the work as, as the three of us have been, it's, it's really hard to, to see what you see. And so it's, it's, it's actually, um, it is a gift. I think it is a gift to be able to to um, to hear this this review. Um, so thank you. Okay, so I want you to start by reading some of this. Um, the well, it's part of the notes on terminology, um, and it's written by you, Tiffany. And the question is, which black feminism? And I just want to read a short excerpt from here because I think we're always quick to go to introductions and explaining why books are important or what they're comprised of and, and we'll get there, right? But I wanted, to, I wanted us to really kind of take a moment to just um, settle into thinking about the premise of this book that became such a or that was, but certainly cemented itself as such a central feature and place of grounding ourselves, not only in thinking, but in terms of our agency and a series of possibilities. Um, and that is black feminism. And that was in particular for Tiffany and I. Um, and so this book that was a, a long time, uh, uh, you know, in, in its processes of birthing, as Tiffany and I um, eventually spoke about it, um, 
it is it is very much grounded in black feminism in its various various iterations so i want to i want to honor that throughout what we do here today but i also want to just honor that in this in this introductory bit that i'm doing our cover image by Charlene Khan sutures and includes contribution in sutures and the included contributions are grounded in a wide ranging invocation of black feminist praxis and concept building. If the tension is about the scale of the personal, subjective, interpersonal on the one hand, and the scale of the structure and institution on the other, we say instead we must have both of these and the scale of the immaterial and the non-human the psyche and the spirit as well too gender racial violence has historically been deployed at multiple dynamic inter interacting scales and i i skip a bit here i'm still quoting of structural intersectionality that produce interstitiality in betweenness and a static stationary position where bodies that are gendered as black are often trapped and carry the tainted markings of immobility. In the contemporary period, power continues to operate through new forms while benefiting from the ongoing legacies of imperial, capitalism, militarism, enslavement, segregation, immigration, restriction, medical and pharmaceutical and biopolitical apartheid, detention and carcerality. In this book, scholars draw on both on genealogies of black feminisms and women of color feminisms and their concerns with disabusing us of the most damaging features of the institution, institutionalization of gender. So, what I what I'm trying to get at, and this is just a, a, a small excerpt from um, from this introductory piece, is I'm trying to say that we think and we feel with these feminisms, and that it was so important for us to weave together these ideas that they're not only concepts, but that they're practices, they things we do, and things that well I hope things I hope we do, but things that we certainly aspire to in this book. And I think that the contributors, um, the, that the various uh, 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 contributions people have made have woven together to form something that we hope really helps us grapple with where we are at now. So in the spirit of kicking us off this way, um, I, uh, one of the, the 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 interesting things I think that that is done with the book is that we weave together these intergenerational voices, right? And so, I think Tiffany, if you would share with us, um, uh, what what are the what, what is what is your investment in this kind of cross generational conversation and dialogue, um, and what are the stakes of doing this kind of research and work? Um, it's really a delight to be here. You know, in my teaching, I teach in Southern California and I teach in a place that has one of the largest South Asian and Southeast Asian population uh, migration centers after 1965. Um, there is a very large community of Vietnamese Americans here um, who, uh, relocated here after, um, you know, what some people call the Indochina Wars, um, but the Vietnam War. And those people moved here and um, not everybody survived, right? They might be living and walking around on their legs, but they didn't all carry um, their self-determining autonomous spirit with them. They just carried their flesh, you know? Um, and one of the things that a colleague of mine in ethnic studies, um, uh, an archivist, Thuy Vaudang, um, 
contributed to several years ago was the founding and building of a Southeast Asian oral history archive on our campus. And it kind of echoes other multicultural, um, digital and physical archives that exist um, around the county to try to track and trace um, experiences of displacement. Um, but I always send my students to that archive, regardless of their background, because just because you live in an intergenerational household or family or kin network doesn't mean that the people who are closest to you, like at arm's reach, are able to tell you what it meant to survive the horror of the Vietnam War or the horror of apartheid or the horror of enslavement, right? It might be, you know, kind of um, Yvette Christiansa style those horrors might be walking around um, and be more activated than the, the physical material people around you, right? You might experience your grandmother's trauma um, and yet and still you need some translation of that. And so the reason why I send my students to that oral history archive is because I need them to be able to um, access um, in easier ways and in more tangible, concrete, material ways, the stories that maybe their own family members can't, you know, articulate. So, you know, you're walking through, you know, a Toni Morrison beloved sort of house growing up as a child, right? And you are feeling the pressure of ghosts around you but there may not be another person from that earlier generation to tell you why is the house so charged? Why when we sit down to these intimate family discussions or when we try to experience a milestone, you know, a wedding or a bar mitzvah or a, why is everything so charged? And these cross-generational oral history kinds of work and just inviting um, people into a cross-generational conversation means that you have some translation that happens. Mm -hmm. So you can get that vocabulary, you can get analytics, you can come to understand that, um, you know, what we survived with, you have choices about how to experience and how to not experience. So that was a very like heady and theoretical way to do this. But part of that cross-generational work comes from, um, or that commitment to that ethic for me um, is something that I was trained in. That's how I was socialized as part of the African diaspora. Um, you know, I was 11 and my grandmother gave me a book by Ruth Butler Brown called Love My Children. And in the book, um, you know, it's a black woman from the US South who experienced the Rose, Rosenwald schools. Rosenwald Fund was a philanthropy that built, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of the first public schools that uh, black people in the US South were able to go to and attend these little rural, you know, one room schoolhouses. I'm 11, right? When I think about my own children who are 11, you know, the expectations of my literacy rate were so high that my grandmother was like, you're 11, you need to read a history of this black woman, this memoir, talking about a whole history of philanthropy and how black teachers created alternatives to education in the midst of a segregated society, right? Mm -hmm. And a racialized world of captivity. Mm -hmm. But that insistence that at 11, whatever my literacy rate was, I needed to be speaking to people from my grandmother's generation was a very powerful political consciousness raising and political socialization expectation. And so in this book, um, whether it's the intellectual generations that you and I have to leap across, or whether it's the, you know, you were trained in one part of the world and I was trained in another part of the world, um, kind of intellectual genealogical uh, crossings that have to happen. It was mm -hmm. really, really important for me 
that um, the quote unquote born free generation um, have access to more of those complicated stories from the struggle generation that weren't just demonized stories, that weren't just caricatured stories. And mm -hmm. might live with movement people and because of what they survived um, or what they witnessed or what they had to participate in as part of like ending colonialism, <laughs> right? They may not be the nicest, easiest people to be around, but I wanted to cite, um, I wanted to cite our readers next to the liberatory imaginary and possibility of those mm -hmm. people, those other generations. You've actually taken us to our next kind of set of, 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 of questions, which is around what are the themes that, that are dealt with in the book, right? And I mean, I, um, I, for me, the themes are around kind of memory and futurity. And I had made some notes saying it's also about building a lexicon that would, that our, part of our intention is that the chapters build this kind of translationary um, infrastructure that it forms part of other literature that does the same, right? Which we know spans now, I mean, since before 94, but I mean, certainly this very uh, intentional um, liberatory post-apartheid rainbow nation narrative that there's a huge body of literature now um, and it's growing and so it forms part of that but I think what is um, what is really interesting is that some of the work is really invested in in pastness some of the work is invested in 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 rethinking reimagining um, uh, kind of dealing with the the complex. Um, there's a word I'm losing. The 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 affect. The book does work to bridge pasts and enter nowness and imagine futures, right? And I um, I feel increasingly more invested in this project. Um, because as you're saying, and I think this ties in so nicely with this, with thinking about the intergenerational elements, um, th there's so much need at the moment for people who live here, young and old, to have their stories heard, but also for um, younger people to make sense of those stories for exactly the reasons that you said, you know, you're walking through a house, you're, you're feeling, there are, there are emotions, there are feelings, there are things that are intangible that you cannot say or articulate um, or rationalize, um, but it's there. And, and, and I'd like to believe that some of what is being done in some of the chapters in this book goes some way in, 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 in kind of helping us tease out some of these quite complex nuanced elements to thinking to remembering to rememory right uh, um, as 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 morrison often reminds us um so for me those are the big themes of the book really it's about building it's about transla translation, but it's also about building new language, new building bridges so people understand each other because there's a lot that is not understood, that is simply not known. Um, and so even for me personally, um, I, I mean, my own research is kind of moving into what I find quite interesting, but even further personal terrain around unpacking ancestors, where they've come from, the, the kind of geographies that they've traversed in the Western Cape in particular. And I just think about how relevant this is to so many communities around this country. Um, so I, I mean, I, I, you're welcome, Tiffany, to kind of build on that in terms of themes that you feel come out quite strongly in the book. But for me, it was, it's very much this, this line that I don't think is a, it's not linear, it's not clear, it's not straight, it's not neat, 
but it is a line of kind of piecing together and and mapping it's about mapping pasts to make sense of of the space that we're in now yeah i love that d that's really helpful um you're reminding me as you were speaking of the the peter hudson piece you know and so this this late you know professor hudson um, who had a storied career and, you know, was a movement survivor and, you know, was detained, you know, many parts of his life and under banning orders and various kinds of forms of captivity. Um, I think about the work of somebody like him who was trained in a very systematic leftist ideological position, right? And him being able to translate in that work from a framework of coloniality to white consciousness. <laughs> That's a lot of terrain to, to leap over, right? Um, for him to be able to kind of, you know, in one of, this is like one of the last things that he wrote before he passed away, you know? For him to be able to come to a kind of, um, you know, Biko or E. Franklin Frazier kind of account of the world and say that, um, you know, racial violence and racial subjection um, counts and, you know, deserves to be on the table for us in our conversations around colonial consciousness and capital um, is just an, it's an incredible thing for me to watch um, because it's very process oriented. Um, I think the same about, um, you know, your piece, D, and the fact that you choose to wrestle with this notion of, um, you know, what is possible for the, for the future of South Africa with regard to the white womb. Like, how do we tell stories about um, reproductivity of white social life? Like, how do we tell that story? Um, I think about that also in terms of the kinds of critique that um, is offered um, by art historian and um, uh, Ashraf Jamal. And what does it mean, you know, for Ashraf and Charlene to say, and to demonstrate for us in this book that the creative cultural work by non-white people is either available as like a tokenized commodity or is available to just be uh, caricatured and pathologized. Like, what does that mean? Um, it's like the kind of encounter, you know, you can imagine indigenous people any place on the planet showing up you know, to the, the, the encounter of conquest and offering, um, you know, a wampum belt, you know, or some like here, I'm bringing you, I'm bringing you my cosmology, I'm bringing you my cultural forms. And then having that meeting that one group is, is experiencing as an equal becoming a situation and a scenario of violence where someone is just gonna just take everything you have and tell you that whatever you brought to the table had no value whatsoever, right? It's a, I mean, it's a very, um, it's a very fraught kind of scenario. And so when I think about the thematics of the book, um, it's about being able to name those power dynamics in very concrete ways and to remind us that it wasn't simply that we fought about um, rights and constitutions. It wasn't simply that we fought over what would be the legal framework in which um, you know, a person you know, of a zania could say, land was taken from me, right? It's also about setting up the, the language, the vocabulary and the grammar for that same person saying the consequence of that land being taken is a consequence of kind of cultural imperialism. Yeah, so that that's for me one of the other big thematics. I want to welcome our other co-editor, Professor Abebe Zagaya, and um, 
Prof Zagaye, I'll actually ask if you will, um, you and I have been in a conversation the past you know, month over and over during some interviews about the stakes of amplifying the voices of women of color academics. And I wonder if you would talk about that as being a thematic in the book, or maybe even share some of those stories about the difficulty of amplifying voices of color and scholars of color. Sure, sure. Um, where do we start? Maybe I'll talk about my experience as a director of UNISA Press and also History Online. It was actually um, for me, I just arrived in the in South Africa from Santa Barbara. And I just saw especially women writers, black women writers, their work being completely rejected right and left. Because I've had experience of editing other books, both in UK and the US. And I thought what I saw of like two, three, four books I published right away when I was there. They were like the normal kind of PhD thesis or collection of essays. And there is this expectation of people of color, in particular women of, of color, you know, their work just get rejected. It just didn't make sense to me. <laughs> then I start talking to them, start reading the papers, and we just have to find a way of presenting them and Interestingly, those books we publish became kind of the corner store of interpretation of color identity, uh, uh, all kinds of issues. It just became, I mean, I'm talking about Zimitri's book, for instance, Zimitri Erasmus. I don't know where she is now, but she used to be, I think, at the University of Western Cape. She's at Wits. Okay, okay. Uh, and, you know, it was, I was just quite surprised because I read the whole essays that different people who contributed and my rule always have been, you know, what is the content? What, what are they saying, which is important? And it was clear to me, they were saying something interesting, something new, new interpretation. But the way South African Academy was constructed especially at the English speaking universities, WITS, UCT, uh, University of Natal, KwaZulu Natal now. Um, all these people has to go through uh, some mediator. Uh, in, in WITS case is quite clear. It has to go through history workshop people, or the historians or the, 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 the sociologists who saw themselves as theoreticians in a very peculiar way. I mean, to me, it didn't make sense how they are theoreticians than the others. And interestingly, some of them are in history workshop, but they were a derivative of what was going on in Europe that they hide in one way or the other, because I was a member of history workshop in Oxford at Ruskin College, which was kind of the forefront of fighting Thatcherism when I was a student here, around 79, 80, 80, up to 84, 85. For I understood what History Workshop was doing, but when the variety which was brought into South Africa through History Workshop was certain kind of interpretation. And unless you follow their quote-unquote political line, you are not published. So Dimitri books came out. Yes, it needed a lot of intervention, it needed a lot of work. Luckily, we had access to uh, NRF, and there was a guy by the name uh, Robert Krieger, who was kind of all the funding for it. For it. He made it available for us. We managed to publish her, her, her collection. And I think, it, I mean, that book is the best example where now everybody who writes about color identity uh, writes about it, uh, used it. The, the person who wrote about it was, it was this guy called Ian Golden, who wrote a book on color identity, which was the most insignificant book. I mean, he's my friend. I should not be saying that, but <laughs> I mean, I know his thesis. We were graduate students together in England. That book was not an important book in terms of saying something interesting. Here is Dimitri, 
with her all colleagues, she brought in this all kind of interesting people and became the definitive work of that time. And I still people, I, I think they could tell past on that people are still using it as, as reference. The other one was um, on Indian identity, Indian South African identity by Rahana Valley. Again, these people were, I mean, this, this black intellectuals were a product of the Saparte system. Rahana was based at the University of, um, uh, in Durban. What was the university name? Now it's become part in uh, Westfield. The, the, in, yeah, Westfield. She didn't speak, from what I remember, she didn't speak a word of French and she got a scholarship to go to Paris, learn French and wrote a PhD in French. For one, begin to see there are very few people who do that, that kind of skill. But again, she was marginalized. She was trained as an anthropologist. I think now she's back in, uh, I think at University of Pretoria now. Again, her book became important. For our book, our collected book is, to me at least, is an extension of that, an extension of enabling uh, South African and other African writers to have a voice. And we'll see how people reacted. I think it's a, an important intervention. Uh, it brought in new people, new people who are seen in the margin of academia, in the margin of quote unquote knowledge production. Uh, knowledge production in South Africa still goes, to, I mean, again, IDD is in the midst of it, I am not, uh, is, is a product of certain institution. It has to come out, out of about half a dozen universities and they have a say of what is right and what is wrong. I mean, the one I mentioned, this, the English medium schools now, University of Pretoria, Stellenbosch, and some of baby free states see themselves as the leading force. And unfortunately, you know, the, 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 what we try to do should, be, should have been done by place like Forte, because Forte uh, kept its own independence. It's one of the few uh, black universities which kept its identity. The others were forced to merge. They became um, Western Cape as well. I'm sorry, Western Capes and, and and Forte. The rest became were absorbed by this institution, like University Pretoria took some of them, UNISA took another one. All this quote unquote in the name of change and high high, you know, in the name of change and um, uh, high quality production of knowledge the places where there would have been proper voices were marginalized or they, they, they disappeared. I had a question for you, Dee, about um, the place you were as a scholar when you wrote the chapter about Tutsi's film and the questions you were wrestling with and why you prioritized that particular film at that place in your career. And I, I'm trying to be mindful of our time because I don't know where we are in terms of our time. And I wanna make sure that, um, you know, our emerging scholar, you know, future Dr. Roman has a chance to actually jump in here. But please, please go ahead. Okay, um, I'll try to be brief because I also, um, I also really want to force Santiago to have enough time. Um, so that's a really interesting question, um, Tiffany. It, you know, I the, the 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 chapter comes from a chapter that I worked on for my PhD, which was part of asking questions about, um, in particular, um, rape. Um, so I don't want to say gender-based violence, but in particular, this idea of rape as an act, as a violent act um, in a kind of post-apartheid space in South Africa. And the, the chapter was comprised of, there, there were other films that I spoke about in this chapter as well. Um, 
And of course, you know, I mean, there are a number of directions these things can go, but I remember the tension um, about <laughs> this decision that I had to make about writing about the rape of white bodies and not women of color, where I had prefaced this both thematically, theoretically, and you know, and other and in other ways throughout the project. And I, you know, it, I, I really struggled with it because, of course, it's an adaptation, right? The, the film Disgrace is an adaptation of Kutsia's Disgrace. Um, and it was, it was this particular scene. And then there was a scene in a film by Oliver Hermanus called Squinate. The English um, release is called Beauty. And it's, it's also about a, a middle-aged... Um, white man living in post-apartheid South Africa trying to make sense of himself and, and where he belongs and I, I really really kind of wrestled with this thing like why preface whiteness in this way in this project that is you know I mean so so personal as, 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 as many of you will know through your own journeys of writing and research um, and so I was in I was in a very particular place that I felt spoke back. Looking back now, I feel it was it was such a reflection of really dealing with the tensions of what I was writing about, what the larger project was about, which was what the hell is going on here? You know, <laughs> what is going on here? What are the sensibilities we're trying to make sense of? And, and, and trying to find a way to articulate the really difficult things that one cannot say. And I found that through watching films, I was able to kind of unpack some of that. But this chapter, you know, it still haunts me actually, you know, um, when I read Meg Samuelson's um, uh, uh, work on, she writes, I, I quote it in this chapter, um, she, she writes about Lucy's soiled womb, right, through this act of the rape. Um, you know, it really sat with me, this, uh, this, the way in which these young men are pitted against this, this white woman who's, who, who works so hard to prove that she belongs here, um, to the point where she's she's almost you know the 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 the, the becoming pregnant the 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 carrying the pregnancy and the heaviness of, of 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 that in in its physical form but also all the kind of metaphors that go with with pregnancy that this was a a way of apologizing you know like i still cannot quite get my head around that so it's it's interesting you ask me that because it's really when we spoke about it um, 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 earlier this week, it really forced me to go back to that place, but it also reminded me so much of how, um, how present that question still is. This question of the rainbow womb. What is the rainbow womb, you know? Um, and I, I think it's a, I think it's a, I think it's a big question, Tiffany, and I, I could definitely go on about it. Um, both about myself in relation to the chapter, but also to kind of unpacking more of, of wh what does that mean? You know, um, who personifies what comes out of the rainbow womb? Because that is also a fascinating conversation around generations that have come beyond the born freeze, right? Those who, um, you know, like my kids, I mean, so, 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 uh, um, yeah, I, th I think it's a really big question. Um, and I think there's a lot to say. It's actually interesting. The other day, everybody was surprised with the new, the, the person who got the Nobel Prize for Literature. I mean, people were shocked because all of us who thought it would be Ngugi, but Ngugi is too political. He's refused to write in English, so he has no chance of getting it, even though he deserves it. But what's interesting about this guy from Zanzibar was, uh, it's it just a uh, thing, you see, so, uh, which brings me to South Africa in a very kind of roundabout. It's like what Dee was talking about, yes, about disgrace in the book, but more importantly about the film in her paper. 
what Robert Mponde talks about, what he calls white reading about Zimbabweans and uh, Rhodesian Zimbabweans and some white South Africans. And the, 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 the assuring thing about getting this Nobel Prize is that the world is moving away from that. I mean, people, the, at least the people in, 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 in Scandinavia think now Africans can speak for themselves. And that is yet to be seen in South African context. I, I must say, actually, I might as well. Uh, I think people were very surprised with these theses because she's writing about disgrace. It has become that text and that person symbolize white writing, if you want. And it got the Nobel Prize for it. Uh, the same thing with uh, Tiffany's work about white poverty for whites refused to be, you know, they always saw themselves as interpreting Africans. They are the, interpret, they are the medium to, to the West, especially to Europe. That is beginning to be shaken up in a very interesting way. Therefore, this book is an attempt to do that. I think it would be interesting how people will respond. The initial response would be from, I think, they were, at least those institutions I mentioned would try to ignore it. But eventually, the younger people would begin, will read it, and we use it as such. And if that happens, we have succeeded. I mean, that's, you know, we, we were writing for that group. We we're writing for people to, not that we, we have this, you know, we're not claiming we have privileged knowledge. But we have certain things to say, and we're saying it. And I think young people will pick it up. And uh, as I'm, uh, you know, I'm having difficulty not to get involved in South Africa for the last 10 years because I've been traveling around. I've been working on Ethiopia, all kinds of issues. But I'm drawn back again and again to South Africa. And I'm actually going back to South Africa soon for I'll be engaging in this thing. for. Working with both Tiffany and Dee has been brilliant for me because it's forced me to think through that. I went, you know, I was, I arrived in South Africa when Mandela was the president, I arrived in 96 in South Africa and stayed for a, a period of time. And many people thought I've gone soft in my head because I left this beautiful, beautiful university in Santa Barbara where people like uh, Tiffany would come, would come to class with their, uh, from the beach with their uh, clothes, what uh, not proper clothes? What do you call those things? <laughs> and we were, but my, it's been the most, in, you know, the most enriching being in South Africa because I was I was immersed in South African issues for the you know then and now as well. For hopefully this book is a big you know people will begin to think differently, for in the younger generation of South Africans would begin to read that. That's why I was very taken by San Diego that actually San Diego is half of my, not half, a third of my age, most likely. Therefore, I'm glad to, read, to see that reading, but I'm very, very happy to do so. Uh, I think I'll, I'll stop there.